she gave more. And we're going to look at the story in Luke chapter 12 tonight, and I'm going to add some other verses to this. But I want you to understand the thing about giving or getting. Ask yourself this question tonight. Why do I want more money? Uh, why do I think I need the bigger car or the better car or the most expensive car? Now, don't get on my case if you have all these things. It's okay. But I want to understand, this drives a lot of people. The newest phone, the newest this, the newest that. Now, I ask ourselves this question. What is enough? What will really satisfy me? When are we going to get to that point that I can say, God, that's enough. And anything else you give me, God, I'm going to give it away. I don't need it. Now, it's something to think about tonight. It's something I really thought about a lot. The Apostle Paul, in his personal life, as we know of it, has taught me a lot about learning to live on what you have and not be complaining about what you don't have. Learning to be content. Now, I don't know if you've ever caught me. You might have uh, out of sorts or upset or not carrying on. But if you do, it's very seldom. People will ask me a question, and, and Pastor, I understand this. I, I know we all have problems. But I had determined a long time ago, all of us have them, whether it be physical or whatever it might be. But people say, how are you doing? I say, great. And how can you say that? Because it's great because I belong to the one who gave his life for me. Amen. He's going to take care of me. So yes, I expect things to come into my life that's not going to be comfortable or pleasant. Do I want them? No. Do you want them? No. But that's a part of going through this life in the flesh. And so we got to determine something. And this is going to help maybe some young couples here tonight, and I hope it helps all of us. Uh, don't get yourself in financial bondage. It'll keep you from doing more for God than you'd like to do. Oh, I'd love to do this, but I can't. We can't because of the choice we made many times. Because we make the wrong choices. I, have, I had to learn since 1972 when I left my job in Memphis, Tennessee after 16 years of it. What it meant uh, to live on what you have. To live on what you have. Is that, you understand what I mean? Living on what you have. Well, I can't live. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. God has taught me something, as Paul says, he learned to be content. What is really enough? What is really enough? Oh, if I just had... Pastor, I, I was looking in my closet, and I have uh, small closets, but I also have a clothes bar out in the shed, out in the back. And I looked in there, and I have more shirts than I can wear, and some of them I've not worn. And I asked me, do I have enough? I, I think I have more than enough. Uh, praise the Lord, a while back, a few months back, maybe a, a very long few months, I went through and analyzed how many suits that I had. So I went there and cut down half of them, get the other half away. Now I'm not saying this to break, I'm saying, and I haven't missed them. I must have needed them. I've got stuff in this shed I had since 1972, I haven't thrown away yet, I must need it. <laughs> and you kind of let's know this. I can go through there and find bills, phone bills, six dollars, uh, gasoline, seventeen cents a gallon. But, but they're reminders to make you uncomfortable because we used to have that. But you know, if you can learn this, all of us, listen, it's not wrong to have if God gives it to you. But how you use it is an important thing. If it's all about self, it's wrong to have it for self. Uh, if you need to understand something. Once you pass that point of it's enough, then God, God's given that to you to do something for somebody else. We're coming up this next week giving an offering for food, oil, and meal, and clothes. What an opportunity for us to give outside of what we would normally do. Think about it. There are folks who don't have all the shirts I've got, or the warm clothes I have, or the shoes I have. 
And yet we can have a chance. God said, I'm giving you an opportunity to do something for someone else besides yourself. How often we ask this question again, and not time to break the spirit, time to say, we ought to get the spirit that God had. He gave his very best. He gave us all. In my lifetime, most of us who go back, we gave the church our leftovers, our used, our worn out stuff. All right, our refrigerator's about to go out. Let's give it to the church, buy us a new one. That was the attitude way back. We never think about giving God the best off the top. Christmas is a fantastic time to learn that lesson of giving. Of giving. What's enough for you tonight? Where do you draw the line and say, Lord, if I just had that, I'd be satisfied. I'd be content. How many times have you said that, but when you got that, you moved the bar a little further up? Or if I just had that, What is enough for any one of us tonight? You cannot come to me and tell me you can't live on what you're making because you can live on what comes in. Because I know this for a fact and Pastor knows this and Ms. Nancy and I and Ms. I don't know. We live by faith supporting other people, supporting our ministry. But if they quit giving, I'm not trusting in them, I'm trusting in God. And as you get older, these things cross your mind. But God keeps reminding me, uh, Joe, I've taken care of the last 50 years, so I think I can continue to do that, the rest of it. So I want to try to plant a seed tonight. It's a great season to do this. There's going to be some receiving and giving of gifts, and I enjoy that. But let me ask you to look around. To find somebody who can help that can't help you back. Do something for somebody else that cannot do something for you. Now, I know Tom and I and Alyssa, we'll, we'll exchange a few gifts, our little gifts. You'll exchange gifts with loved ones or friends. I'm not talking about exchanging, I'm talking about giving. Expecting nothing in return. That kind of attitude. Let's read Luke 12, verse 16 through 21. And I do it for this mic over. I hope this helps you. I appreciate Pastor allowing me the privilege to preach here, to, to be a blessing to my home folk, my family here. Luke 12, verse 16 says, And he, Jesus, spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentiful. Plentiful sounds like a pretty good bunch to me. And he thought, where? Within himself. Think within yourself tonight how good God's been to you. Think about it. I would venture to say tonight the poorest person in this room tonight is richer than a lot of folks around the world. We have more than they've ever had or seen. We've got to remember we don't compare ourselves to what others have or don't have. We compare ourselves with ourselves I'm my own heart thinking. You know, all these years all the places I've been, the ministries I've been involved in, God has never failed to meet my need. He did it, he did it in ways that surprised me. I, I wasn't the way I do it. Uh, I could give God a good plan how to take care of me. I, I, I could give a list to God. Now, if you do this, this, and this, and, and, and Lord, make sure that, Lord, that if I get to live another year or two or five or ten years, whatever, Lord, that I have sufficient funds. But it's not the funds, it's the faith in the Lord's going to make the difference. God's going to be there for me and for you too. I know it's okay, it's important that you set aside some to take care of special needs now in the body. I understand that. But don't leave the Lord out. Have some faith involved in that. Trust Him in all that. Don't think, now you have these reports on the news and think, you know, you'll need X amount of hundred thousands of dollars, whatever it is, to make it, you know, after you in your retirement. Well, I'm not going to make it then, folk. I just have to say it's going to be a difficult time for me when that time comes. That, but I, I don't see that kind of money in my life. If I don't have to, I've got a Father in Heaven who said He'll meet my need. Amen. He'll meet your need. And keep that in mind. He will. Don't depend upon yourself to have to do it all. The best way to do it now, if you and I have 
a retirement plan, invested in heaven. Invested in the things of God. And you'll see the dividends are going to be great. Far better than any interest you could draw in this lifetime. So he said, he thought within himself, saying, What shall, and when I stop, you read the next word. What shall I <coughs> do because have no room where to bestow fruits. And he said, this will do. And we'll pull down and build greater and there will I bestow all my fruit and goods. I think you can kind of get in the grip and who's this fellow thinking about? Himself. Now, next to Nicholas, and We'll say to, you know, his soul is not the Lord's. Thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take that eat, take down ease, eat, drink, and be merry. I've heard so many folks saying, "Well, when I retire, I'm going to have a ball. I'm going to go travel here and there. I'll get a home down in Florida in the winter time and summer." I mean, they're planning their ahead how they're going to live, where they're going to live. We don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. Not all this. God's going to be there waiting on me. And for you. Now I'm not trying to discourage anyone from taking care of their needs and taking care of their future uh, to a point. But when we go beyond a certain point, I think God gives us actually to be a blessing. Not for ourselves. But look at verse, uh, verse 20. What's, what's the first two words? How many times has Pastor said, but God, it changes now. God's going to get involved. God's going to say something. It's me, my, I, myself, it's mine. But God said. Is that important? It doesn't matter what we think or what we plan. It's what does God say to our hearts? But God said unto him. What? Now, wait a minute. I must not have heard you. But God said unto him, so he's calling this man a fool. And there's a reason you understand. It's all about himself. It's not about his neighbor. It's not about missionaries. It's not about missions. It's not about being a blessing to the church and help meeting in this. Uh, and people you run into every day. Whenever I leave the house, I do this. Ask God to let me be a blessing to someone. And I look around to see if there's someone I can help or be a blessing to. Uh, I'm not saying this to say, hey, I'm a good guy. I'm not. But I find more joy in doing for others than receiving. I really do. I praise God that, as, and the pastor said it so many times, in our church. The church is not a real farm. It's a channel. He comes in here and goes out here. Now some stays to take care of the needs. We understand that. But once your personal need is met, then there ought to be something going out this end. And if it doesn't go out, it's going to stop coming in. So remember this. What comes in needs to go out after your need is met, after God satisfies your need, when it's enough to take care of you and your family. Then God says, now you have some choices. And there's different kinds of giving in the Bible. And Christmas time is a great time to think about giving beyond your family, your friends, what's expected. I mean, there's so many opportunities around us. Maybe in our church family, there may be some families in our church that I'm not aware of, maybe, but there's needs there. And some of you may know those needs. Let God use you. Even at the broadcast. You can do it without even being known how you who helped them. There's ways to do that. It's not because you can be bragged on your bagged on the back. It's because you want to do something for God. If God said if you do it to the least of these, who have you done it to? You done it to him. When was I hungry and you fed me? When I was so thirsty, you gave me the drink. When I was sick and you came to me. When I was in jail, you visited me. We never done that. If you did it to the least of these. You've done it unto me. How am I going to do for God? Doing for others. I haven't met my Savior yet, my God. 
So if I'm going to do something for God, I got to do it to His creation, to the people around me that God brings in and through my life. For God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee, and who shall all these things be which thou hast provided? Here he is, he's got his friends made. I mean, to tell you, he had plenty of, and the uh, crop was great. And he says, as it came in, I'm going to tear down my barns and build bigger barns. Let me ask you this. Did you already have enough? If your barns are full, what more do you need? If your cupboard has food in it, what more do you need? Give me this day, my lady bread. I'm not trying to keep you from ha having tomorrow's stuff. I'm just saying, if we plan it that way, that's the wrong way to look at it. We've got somewhere in line to trust God. To learn to give something that leaves you with a need. That sounds strange, doesn't it? But Pastor, if I do that, I don't have a need. God wants you to a place where you realize you have a need because you did something for Him. And watch how He takes care of that need. But it's got to be the right motive. The right reason. The right purpose behind it. I know it's a lot of people will get to, oh, if I give this, will God multiply it ten times? Not necessarily. I'm trying to use myself as an example. Like I'm right now experiencing blessings and be able to preach to some churches up north because of folks I was helped over 20 something years ago and had forgot all about it. It was a spontaneous uh, doing something for somebody and I did not know they had that need. I, they didn't tell me they had that need. But God did. And now God has reciprocated me much more than I did for them at that time. Now think about that. A need is something that you ought to be geared to when God is, there's a need. He will lay it on your heart. I don't go out and say back and be foolish and do the things that God's not leading you to do. But you'll know when God's in it. You'll be impressed by the Holy Spirit of God if you're seeking to do something for God. And, but here's a fellow. It was all about himself. Now, he could have been a hard worker. Uh, all this could have been honestly uh, acquired. And that's fine. But see, God was watching what he did with what he got. And God is watching you and watching me. You see, it's not the amount of money you have. It's what you do with what you've got. That's all that God is asking. If God has blessed you abundantly, He doesn't expect abundant use out of you. If God has blessed you sparingly, then He doesn't expect that much out of you, no, no more than He's blessed you with. And this time, uh, it's all about Him. Christmas is really all about Jesus giving Himself for us. What a lesson being taught here. He gave the greatest gift ever given. Did God sacrifice something? Do we really, really know what sacrifice is tonight? I mean, do we really know what it means? Uh, I mean, we're talking about grace giving, faith giving. I mean, going beyond, the Philippian church went beyond what they could do. What a relationship Paul and the Philippian church had together. And sometimes you need to practice it. Just try it. Try it. When I left the Black like, Ass Order in 1972, I've never been in debt since then. I haven't charged anything. If I don't got it, I don't get it. And I don't get it if it takes away from me to do something for God. And it keeps on filling up all barrels up, Pastor. It's just not running out. Now, my father and your father owns a cattle on the thousand hills. Amen? You may get a hamburger at a time, but you'll get your portion. Don't always have to be steak. I'm saying in life, if we can gear our thoughts toward Him first. That Paul says, I I'm crucified. I don't really, Paul said, I don't really matter. I'm not even living. It's Christ living in me. He's going outside of Himself. It wasn't about Paul, it was about others. And certainly, we need to learn that lesson. But here's a fellow that didn't. 
And he said in verse 18, Remember, this is what I do. I will put out my barns and build bigger, great barns. Then will I bestow all my goods and my fruit. And I will say to my soul, <coughs> Soul, thou hast much good played up for many years. Now, there may be some in this room tonight. And God is blessed with health and hard work and intellect. You, you've done well in life by God's grace. Amen. Amen. Now he's going to say, What are you going to do with it? How are you going to use it? Now, I know we got some great givers in our church and stuff. I should say, official givers in our church. And there's no one in this church I can think about that wouldn't do what God asked them to do. But I'm thinking, imagine. Just imagine this. If God gave you more than you needed, oh, what you could do for God, what God would use you to do, what He'd like you to do, if you'd want to do that. Then no, God, don't put, God doesn't put pressure on you. It's a choice. It's that willing, cheerful giver. And we can't help but talk about giving tonight. This is the season. Uh, everybody's buying gifts and giving gifts. And we're talking about, what about Jesus? And pastors <laughs> emphasize that. This coming Sunday is going to be a great day to do that, reach outside ourselves, and uh, make that gift to Jesus a worthy gift, an honorable gift. It can be used for need. But God said, now, you're a fool if you're thinking that way. You're a fool. Now, go down to verse, excuse me, 21. So is he, is a fool, so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. He says, we're like that man. Maybe not to the extent he had. But what are we depending upon, honestly? What am I depending upon? Is it my social security? Is it the few churches that support me that, that I'm going to depend upon? Or am I going to depend upon the Lord? And if we use our income, the blessings God gives us properly, it will go a lot further than it could to any other way. Where is your treasure tonight, really? Where is your treasure? Is it in the house? In your vehicle? In the gadgets you can get? Everything new and improved. Uh, uh, we want it. Every new toy, every new game that comes out. Um, we want it. But do we really always need it? Do we have enough games? There's a car. Is the car okay? You ain't got enough gadgets on it. Now, I, I, you got those nice things. That, that, that's fine. I get calls all the time now about my car running out of uh, insurance or whatever's on it. That's great. They don't know where my car is right now. Is that good? You still got that thing? Yes. <laughs> oh, brother. That's been around a while. I had it. Tom Les had it. Diane Andrews got it. But I'm thinking, you know, I don't know about you. I stop and think. I guess I think so simply. I guess because I never had a lot that I don't worry about it. And with Mother Gammon, you know, uh, if you had it, you'd be like, uh, I don't want it if it changed me. I really don't. I'm going to do more for God. And I try to do what I can. But I think, of, I, I think about these things in my own personal life. And I found this out, Pastor. When you get beyond and put yourself in need, the refrigerator lasts as longer. The vehicle lasts as longer. The appliances go longer. I mean, it seems like the clothes wear longer. I grew up the time when I got married in a blue fur suit that uh, two of the brothers had for our guy. I'm glad I had older brothers, so I'm really happy now. I had some sisters that older. I'm glad for two brothers that older me, because I hate to be wearing their happy downs. That'd be bad. But nowadays it's acceptable in our society. Now, what is your motive? What is my motive for giving? Now, think about now. We're giving gifts. What is our motive for giving gifts to one another? I mean, what is it because they expect it? Uh, because I feel it's my duty? Uh, we need to have the right motive when we do something. It's because I love them. And I want to be a blessing to them. And that's an extension of our love for them. It's just sharing that that God shared with us a gift. So, why do you want more money? Is it because you can get more? 
Or because you can give more. What's our motive? See, we have a motive for everything we do. We all do. I have a motive for what I do. You have a motive for what you do. Let's pray that our motive is led by the Holy Spirit of God. We do it because God's showing us and telling us to do this. We have a motive for everything we do. And we need to ask ourselves, what is my motive? Why am I doing this for God? Why am I doing this for the church? Is it that passion earn brownie points? Is it to try to impress somebody else? Or is it to just glorify God and do it? Just doing it because you look, you, because you can and because you want to. So we, we sometimes we have selfish motives and sometimes we have selfless motives, but we need to know what they are. <laughs> what is it going to take to satisfy myself and bring me to that point of contentment? And that's what we're driving for. Just to be content. We're living in a discontented world. I know a pastor and I understand this. I'm not content of, in the world itself. I'm, I need to be content in spite of the world. Uh, Paul wanted to be content in whatever condition or state he was in. Now, whatever, like, found him, he, he learned to be content in that situation. Several people have asked me over the years, uh, Joe, where's the, the, the favorite place you've been? That's where I was at that time. I can go to Ireland, but well, it didn't bother me at all. It didn't bother Andrew at all either. What a lovely day. Come down the stairs. It's the attitude. It's, it's, they say, be content in whatever states you're in. Be content. We need to learn this. So, do you think that having more things will bring you peace, joy, and happiness? Are things the thing that's going to bring that contentment in your life or that happiness in your life? No. You know, in a couple of weeks, Christmas is going to be over. We go back to the same old routine. We can fake contentment for a while. But when it's overcast, when it's cold, when it's dreary, uh, when there's sickness, can you not find contentment just knowing that God's aware of this and knows this about you? See, all the things we could buy and never bring contentment or joy or peace. So it's important that we understand this. See, God gives us the gift of grace. It helps to be content if we do it. Now, what I want to do is just read some scriptures. You notice I haven't got any points tonight. Follow. Pastor's one of the greatest Bible teachers I've ever been under. I, I know we're going to say this. I don't want to build him up. But he'd take the scriptures and go through that. Well, God didn't give me that gift or ability or the mental power to do that. I'm very simplistic. I'm on the right under the bottom shelf where everybody can get to it. And so you have to understand that. You're not getting an education tonight, Bible education. You're being reminded of a simple thing tonight. What's enough? What's going to make you satisfied? Uh, and let me give you a, 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 excuse me, a definition of contentment. Contentment. Satisfied, sufficiency, to suffice, to be enough, happy with what you have, pleased with, at ease and at peace. Till we learn to be content on what we have right now and be satisfied. If this is what God all He wants me to have, praise the Lord. And be content. Be satisfied. But I don't find many satisfied Christians nowadays. I really, really don't. Always reaching out. Always, it, it's going to take a little bit more to make me happy. And they'll never find contentment seeking it that way. Go to Philippians chapter 4, if you would, please. Philippians 4, verse 11 through 13. Now I'm trying to tie this together on the idea of this trusting God. Now watch this, Philippians 4, verse 11. Now this is Paul speaking. Not that I speak in respect of want. For I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be. Well, that's that means when you're feeling good and your eyes well and you don't have, have, have diabetes and 
and all those things, then I'll be content. Or when the cupboard's full and when and everything just going my way and it's a smooth, I'll be content. That's not what he's saying. In whatever condition, state, or situation you find yourself, you find your contentment in the Lord and His promises. I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. I'll be there for you. He says in verse 12, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere, in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Read uh, Galatians. You'll find out what all, some of the things that Paul went through. Uh, and yet you can say, I, I've got to be content. See, Paul had died his self. His self was not important. Hey, let's not make ourselves more important than we are. God ought to be the most important thing in the person in our lives. And we need to be content with that relationship. And that's our problem. If that relationship is right, you won't be content. But when that relationship's out of sorts, you'll never find peace or contentment. And you'll never find the part if you're not with your brother or your sister in Christ or anybody else. If you break that fellowship, you'll never find contentment. Because you, you're all, you turn yourself inward instead of outward. Take care to edify one another in the Lord. We're heading into a new year. And a, and a new adventure for this church. It's going to be a lot of roads, a lot of bumps, a lot of pipe to change and repair. A lot of things going to have to, it's going to have to happen if we get to the desired end that God is leading us to. And we've got to do it in harmony and unity. We've got to learn to give of ourselves. And, and, and I don't really matter. You know, I can give my opinion. Let me give it to you this way. Everybody in this room, we have an opinion, right? And we have a right to have our opinion. We also have a right to not give it. And I have found myself, I find it easier. I may differ from the pastor how I'm going to do something. I don't do it less than my daughter gets on me. No, I, I can do that. I can think, well, Brother Tom, you know, this, this, or that. You know what happens? My opinion won't change the terms and it won't change the fact that the work's going to go on or what's going to be done. It doesn't have to be done my way just so God gets the glory. And so this is a talk about find that contentment in your life. Be at peace with one another. So, do you, do you want to be satisfied? Do you, do you want to be at peace and, and rest with yourself and with God and with others? Here's what he's saying. He said in verse 13, now we look at verse 12, and he said, Unstructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. Then he said in verse 13, what? You probably know that. I can't. We're going to get there. I can do all things. I can't hear you. How are you going to do all things? Bingo. It's through Christ. Not your main plan, not your super plan, not all your things. It's you're going to do this. You can be content through all this through Christ, not through the flesh. So as we think about this, he says, I have learned. He said, I've come to an understanding. Paul went to enough to, he, he learned his lesson. He learned no matter where I am, when I'm under whatever pressure it is. I've learned. I have come to an understanding. He says, I know. I am aware of what real contentment is. I see it and I understand it now. He said, you know, it's not the thing. It's not how comfortable I am. It's what I have. It's my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Even in prison at midnight, having been beaten in stocks, you find him praising the Lord and worshiping God. And we fuss about the least little thing. Oh, we need to have that kind of contentment. That he was there, and God was going to use him. Paul said, God has allowed me to be here. There's a purpose, and it was. Well, they've been jailed this time we got saved. Church gets started, and others get saved. It's because of that. 
He said, I'm instructed. Though all my trials and troubles and tribulations, the Lord has taught me to be content. That sounds like a contradiction. Can we really have contentment in the midst of a storm? If the Lord's in your boat, you can. Can we have contentment in the troubles and trials? That's when the Holy Spirit comes alongside. He'll comfort us and guide us. And he says, I can. I can. I can. I am able. I have the strength because Christ provides the grace, the enablement, and the power. You can and I can be content in no matter what the situation we're in because God's grace supplies the power. Now go to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. He's talking about gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world. Do you realize that? Do you really understand? You didn't bring anything into this world. And you're going out the same way. You don't care nothing. Anything you got gained in this world other than the Lord Jesus Christ and salvation. You're going to leave behind. It's going to be gone. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Now watch this. Verse 8. And having food and raiment, let us be there with. Let us be there what? Food and raiment. I could tell a lot of toys and nice things to have and all the other things. He said, if you even down to that, be content. The best is yet to come. We've heard that quite a bit around here. The best is yet to come. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts. This rich guy, the guy that had the bars, he fell into that trap. He began to gain. He began to gain. I would guarantee you this. If you would follow around or check the life out of all these people we know, the millionaires, the multimillionaires, the rich folks that people look up to, they're not as happy as I am. They really are. They have to watch out Mike taking something from them. Uh, they don't know who the true friends are anymore. But I know who my friends are. And you should know who your friends are. It's not always the ones that can do for you. It's the one that's there for you when you get into a need. And it's always, always somebody a part of that. He says, it may be, <coughs> excuse me, but they that will be rich fall into temptations and snares and into many foolish hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Be careful when God allows you to have material things or money. Be careful. It is powerful. Money is a powerful thing to have. The devil knows how to use it against you. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Now, how do you get that it most of the time? Money, the root of all evil. Money's not evil. It's just a thing. Uh, it's like a cell phone or anything else you have. It's just a thing. It's how you use it. Not let it use you. Money's the root of all evil. Excuse me. Which while some covet after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Let me just read a couple of those for you. Hebrews 13.5 says, Hebrews 13.5, Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with, with, with the such things as you have. For he said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Why can you be satisfied and content? Because God will never leave you nor forsake you. You'll not find his seed begging bread. We can trust him, church. You can trust God. No matter what it looks like, you can trust God. So he says you can be liberal in your giving and in doing. Proverbs 15, 16 says this. Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Proverbs 16, 8. 
Better is little with, little with righteousness than great revenues without right. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. I moved to it fast. Matthew 6, 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. Where moth and rust and death corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But verse 20. You probably didn't know this one. But lay up for yourselves treasures where? In heaven. I honestly challenge myself in this area. Lord, I want more up there in your treasure house than any treasure house down here. Lord, I want a better investment in heaven than I do here on earth. Because I know the dividends are greater when God gives it up than it is down here. So, he says, you know, it, it just, where, where's your treasure? Here's your heart's going to be. Comes down here, it, 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 money's corrupt and everything else. Now, I'll give you one word. It comes back to this. Faith. You've got to apply the gift of faith. Without faith, it's what? Impossible. Impossible to please God. Now, somebody quote to me, Hebrews 11.1. Now, faith is? I can't hear you. Faith is a substance of things. That's a confident expectation. And what? Evidence. So it's substance and evidence. Let me give you uh, kind of a meaning of this, this first verse. He says faith is substance and evidence. All right, substance. It is the essence, the stuff, the thing, the object, the element, <coughs> the central or essential part of something. That's substance. This is substance. When your faith has substance, it's going to be seen. It's going to be recognized. It's going to be real. Then he says, evidence. The proof. Faith will have proof. It is something that serves as a tangible, verifiable, confirmation. Evidence means that it is an apparent. This describes the Word of God, the living Word, Jesus Christ. We prove our faith by our actions. Abraham, God said, faith, what he did. Our faith is an action, what we do. Our faith is going to be an action in what we do with our monies, our finances, what God provides for us. So evidently now, stay with me on this. If in my area of giving, in order to prove faith in God and, and trust God, then I've got to be in a position to do something, to do something that is evident that it took faith to do it. We talk about faith giving pastor. You know, my uh, giving to missions, my faith promise to missions, and I will say this here, I'm going give. I give the, I kept giving the same thing after Ms. Allen died and I was giving when she was alive and I lost about an income because she had some social security coming in also. That promise we made together, I'm keeping that promise, even now. And God's allowed to do it. I haven't missed the time. We're less. And yet, it seemed like we didn't, and never come short. I always stay scared of everything. And I say, that's one way I'm going to show in faith. Now, let me give you a definition of faith as I see it, okay? Faith is allegiance, it's a belief, it's a trust, it's a confidence, it's a dependence, an assurance, and a reliance. The object of our kind of faith is called pistos, P-I-S-T-O-S. That's another name for the Lord, pistos, which means God is faithful. God is faithful. So if we can experience this kind of faith, church, in our own personal lives, it affects our whole church. Every one of us in this room tonight truly and sincerely as brothers and sisters all are truly love 
one another. We say it, but do we really show it? Is there a faith in our hearts tonight to say, Lord, I'm going to trust you? We are His children. We're going to spend eternity together. We ought to start practicing a little bit now. This faith that says, it's not about me, it's all about Him. And when it's about Him, it's going to be about others. And I don't know how much more time God's going to give me. I really don't. And I know I have not given God my best in the past. I know that. But there's no reason I can't give Him the rest of what I've got before He calls me home. We all can do that. We've all failed in the past. And this means that we put faith in the one who is faithful. God says, I'll take care of you. You put yourself in a place of need because of me. I will meet that need. As we think about it. next week and the holidays we're celebrating and the birth of our Savior. All the way through the Bible. Faith was honored by the Lord. Faith. When he saw her faith, when he saw his faith, when he saw so little faith, so great a faith. What's enough? That means that we have enough faith to trust God no matter what comes if we put him first. What do you really need tonight? Honestly, think about it. What in your life you could say, I really, really need this to make it complete. Or I need this to be happy. Or I need this to be content. What is that? And if that was true, and God gave it to you, would that satisfy you? Would that end that? I need more. I think I have found this to be true in my life. And I say this very carefully. And I've talked to the Lord about this situation, about certain things, about needs, or I think I get their needs. And simply, he didn't, I didn't hear any words, but I talked to my Heavenly Father, and I said, my Father, you know, sometimes I get concerned about tomorrow's. And he lets me talk like I normally do, but then I have to listen to his word, to his spirit. He says, don't worry about it. That's my job. You just trust your Father. And I'll take care of you. See, it's God's job, Pastor, to take care of me on His Son. As long as I'm with the Father and follow the Father. Now, if He says, don't go that way, and I go that way, I may be on my own. But I'm saying to us tonight, what is enough? Really? What, what is enough? I was sitting here counting my blessings. If I was talking to another pastor, I said, you know, I know where my riches are right now. I really do. It's my family. It's my friends. It's my faith. Faith first, family and friends. I'm very rich to have friends. I have a lot of acquaintances. But think about the friend that God gives you. And I found out to have friends, you got to be what? Think of me. <coughs> Would you bow your heads with me, please, tonight? I know this is not the typical Christmas case. But it's a great time to think about our purpose, our reason. You know the gift that you and I could give tonight, honestly and sincerely tonight? If we truly want to be right with God, we need to be right with one another, with each other. And we want God to bless Calvary Baptist Church in this coming year. And to see that building sit on that property that God gave this property for. Let's don't throw it away. Let's make sure it happens. Let's not let the devil take away from us what God wants for us to use here. So look around this room tonight. I see a lot of friends. Some may be closer than others. Some of you may be just in acquaintance with me. But we are family. We are brothers and sisters if you're saved tonight in this place. And I think one of the greatest gifts this church could give tonight to the Lord is to be one body in Christ. 
united and come together and say to God, dear God, we give you this body to use to serve you any way you want to be used. To sincerely love and forgive and encourage and edify one another in the Lord. What a gift to give a church family as a gift to the Lord who gave his life for us as a church family. It takes humility. It really takes, you know, maybe I was wrong. It takes forgiveness. We need to give it and accept it. It may be dangerous what I'm going to do tonight. I don't know if it's going to work or not. But I know this. God said, let there be unity in the house of God. Let there be one accord. And we gather around the Lord Jesus. The light. The star. The tree. The love that God expressed. We need that kind of love. Not a fleshly, weak love. And we know who we are. And I want to say this night, if I, me personally, you have a problem in your heart about me, something I offend you with, or the way I care of myself, I want to know that. I do not want to have anybody think less of me than I want to be. We will give an invitation to this scares me to death, even bring itself, but I know that I know in my heart, as I read the scriptures, the New Testament, unity, one accord. They had all things in common. They were together. Same path, same purpose, serving the same God together. I want you to stand to your feet, if you would, please. And, and I'm really not going to ask us to sing the last again as play. But I want you to think of a couple of minutes. I know this is the oddest service yet. And I didn't plan this in. But I look around and see your faces. And I see what the devil would love to do. He'd love to show discord. He'd love to show pride and unforgiveness in our hearts. Let's not let him do that, church. Let's not let him do that. And I want to start with me tonight. If I have offended you, even not knowingly, something I may have said or the way I've done something, I ask for your forgiveness. I do not want to enter the Holy Spirit's blessing, Calvary Baptist Church, and what God's planning for us. I don't want to be a church with a surface, but I want to be something that's deep. The devil can't divide. He does enough work on that. God's been good to us, better we deserve. And so, as he has his plan, I'm going to have a word of prayer. And I'm going to ask us to do this tonight. If you need to do this, you could do this. Let's get united tonight in one heart. If we are, let's, let's, let's let everybody know it tonight. If we can do this, and you're willing to join a circle of unity tonight, I want us to gather around this building with hands to join outside. There's a big circle tonight. And I want to pray for us as a church. And we're saying, by doing this, God, I have given to you tonight, Lord, my commitment to this body that I belong to. And Lord, it's not my will, but your will be done, Lord. Father, we have a lot to do for you. And we can't do it, Lord, if we're not united in one cause. And be willing tonight to learn what's enough and let God have all the rest. So as he plays, I want to step down here and I want to ask those who would join me just like a circle around this building. Just go against the walls and just grab a hand. And let's give you time tonight. Get around the wall to make sure everybody's connected. I know this is probably for you, for you, strange. But I don't want this circle to be unbroken. I don't want this circle to be unbroken. I hope you don't want that. Please grab one next to you and switch out the F2. And there's a couple of times that we don't. 
Go in the circle. Can you do that? You say, what a weird church. Well, you know. But this is important to my heart tonight. Because I know the devil wants to tear us hard out of this church. Too much happened, too much sacrifice already made, too many tears shared. And right now, I want to give anybody an opportunity. Let's give a word of testimony and glory to God tonight if you'd like to do that in this church family tonight. Who would like to do that tonight? I just praise God for, for the church, for the family, for Brother Tom, for you, Brother Joe. You're such a blessing to me. And to all, all of our people. I mean, I look around and we've got all these new people that's come in yes. and they just... They fit right in. Yes. I mean, they're family. We just love them. All of them. And I just want to be a blessing to all of them. Thank you. Someone else? This is a good opportunity. Our Christmas gift to Jesus tonight. Our friend. It's been a tremendous blessing to be here. And we, me and my wife and family, we fought a feeling at our own church, sadly. And we fought and fought it. You don't want to let go of things, and then finally you let go. And it's for the better, even though you don't think it is. And so we're put, we were put here for a reason. And Amen. We didn't know why. Yes. But we found a true family, something that we didn't have before. We thought we had a good church. We thought we had good people, but really, you don't know until you really try. You find the right place. And it's, it's a blessing to be here with you. Tonight, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 